evening. And welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones, here to answer your questions tonight. Rising Labour star Ed Husick, Greek singing legend and former European MP Nana Muscuri, Guardian Australia columnist Van Badham, Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer Kelly O'Dwyer and editor of the Financial Review Michael Stutchbury. Please welcome our panel. And remember, if you've got a live Twitter question to send us, add at Quandit. Help us find it amongst the millions of other questions. Well, let's go straight to our first one from the floor, and it's from Leah Vesic. Thank you. Saturday's anti-Islam and opposing anti-racism rallies have further illustrated Australia's boiling, point, uh, bo boiling pot of emotion towards multiculturalism and the asylum seeker issue. We're not only seeing more frequent bouts of protest and passionate debate, but these are becoming more violent, with the latest scenes of the burning of the Australian flag, scenes that are more synonymous with the American culture than ours. As our society is exposed to more of these events fueled by cultural tensions and political propaganda, will we become a society that has accepted this level of inappropriate and violent behaviour as a new norm? All right, let's start with Van Batten, because I just learnt earlier you are at the Counter Rally in Melbourne. I was very proud to be at the Counter Rally in Melbourne uh, because I have learnt from history that this is not a new phenomenon, that we know that when there are cultural tensions and language of cultural division, that opportunistic people exploit them in order to promote their own causes. And I'm speaking specifically about neo-Nazism and fascism, which are horrible words to have to say in Australia. But we, like any country, has an extremist element Element. We have an extremist element on the very far right. They are tiny, but they're feeling quite emboldened by a lot of divisive language that's been used against particularly the Muslim community. And in the debate around asylum seekers, there has been, unfortunately, a lot of racist commentary, and that has given the extreme right, the far right, the confidence to put on a little bit of a public show. Tell me, what was the, the rally like from your perspective? Because the, the questioner seems to be saying that both sides were responsible for problematic behaviour, including the flag burning. Well, absolutely. I don't engage in flag burning and I wouldn't. I attended the counter-protest in my capacity as a, a citizen who's very passionate about multiculturalism and inclusion. I certainly don't in, at ever any point endorse violence as a means of political engagement. In fact, I was there to put my body in front of neo-Nazis and fascists and to stop the spread of their ideas. Because what we've learnt from history and the incident I always recall is the one in 1936, the Battle of Cable Street, where where the Jewish community and the progressive community in London banded together to stop a march of Oswald Mosley's black shirts through the streets of London. And it was their action in 1936, which many people attribute to, the, to stopping the spread of organised fascism in Britain, because the fascists were humiliated, like the cowards they are, they retreated. And it was an incredible victory for progressive people and humanity worldwide. So that's why I was there. I will not stand for fascism. And I think we should all be unambiguous in our condemnation of it. I'll just go back to uh, our question. <laughs> yeah, Leah, um, do you buy that? Because, I mean, you, uh, you seem to be suggesting that both sides were uh, in the wrong in some way, in your question. Uh, not so much that. I think it goes back to the political debate that we're having, or probably that we're not having. The politicians do have the control and the power to subdue a lot of the emotion um, that's coming out of all of this, uh, but nothing's being done. It's kind of left free-for-all, so you have the extremists on both sides taking law into their own ha hands, essentially. All right, let's hear from one of the politicians, Kelly O'Dwyer. Well, look, um, I think that Australians are very tolerant. I think we live in a very tolerant society and I think that we embrace multiculturalism in this country and I think that's what stands Australia apart from most other countries in the world. We have been able to live in peace and harmony and that is a wonderful thing. I think that there are extreme elements within our community, both on the right and also on the left. And I think that the best way to combat these sorts of repugnant ideas is not necessarily by having a physical confrontation because I abhor violence. I think the best way to confront these ideas is by challenging them. Challenging people through their ideas rather than through physical confrontation. Do you accept, I that's, think what Van, do you accept that's what Van Batten was actually doing? Challenging well, racism? That's well, how she well, I, 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 don't, I, I don't speak for Van. Van can speak for herself. I mean, I read reports that there were people there who tried to drive out 
other protesters, whether they were on the right or the left of this particular divide. And I think, I think actually that that is not healthy. I think in a society you should actually attack people's ideas, you shouldn't attack people. And I think that that is the most persuasive way to kill off ideas that are repugnant. Right, to I, was, I, I was absolutely there to attack ideas. I was there to take a stand against fascism. Did you see any violence? Did I see any violence? Well, uh, where I was standing in the crowd, reports reached me of fascists throwing rocks. I had my own placard ripped up by one of the fascists who was in attendance. I mean, I was surrounded by people who had swastikas on their necks. That's pretty unambiguous in terms of the statement they are making. In the promotion of that Reclaim Australia rally, the organisers had to ask their followers politely to not wear their Nazi memorabilia in public. If you are an organiser of a demonstration and you have to make that call, who are you representing? You cannot reason with people who have swastikas tattooed on the backs of their heads. Those people abrogated reason a long time ago. What you can do is shut them down. What you can do is organise a large majority of people. We outnumbered them 10 to 1 in Melbourne, and thank God we did. Right. Because the worst thing we could do is pretend that those people have legitimacy, pretend that they have a right to be bigots, pretend that fascism is somehow a legitimate contribution to Australian political discourse. Right, let's hear it from is the, not. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Let's hear from the other uh, politician on the panel, Ed Husick. Uh, what do you make? Uh, first of all, the question that was asked there? I think uh, one of the things I drew out of the, the, the question itself is that not only is there a, a need for us to be able to ad address the ideas as Kelly was saying, but it's important to send out the signal from regardless of political party that the best thing that we've got going for us is that the middle isn't squeezed out by the edges. That is, that the edges of this debate that want to um, feed off fear, that they not be given the opportunity uh, to allow people in the middle uh, I actually think the biggest danger for us is not so much the fear itself, it's doubt, starting to doubt people that you're with, doubt the authenticity or their commitment to their country or their love of their country, and to make people think twice, should I be dealing with this person? The way I used to deal with them, was it right? And we need to have uh, people across the political spectrum say that this country has been built off the back of, you know, if you look, seven million migrants coming in post-World War II, we're a success story on the national and international stage. And uh, the reason we've got that way is because we've worked together. Ed, and we need Ed, to keep uh, finding ways to do Did you regard uh, that series of rallies? There were 16 planned around the country, and they were against Islamification of the country and Sharia law. Did you regard these rallies as anti-Islam? Uh, look, as, let a me, Mus as a Muslim yourself. Let me put it to you this way. Um, I put in as much stock in Reclaim Australia, speaking up for the broad public, as I do extremists rep misrepresenting uh, my faith. You know, they don't, you know, Reclaim Australia does not represent the great things that I see in the broader community uh, and the, the way in which people get on. Um, and uh, I don't think we should let them define the way in which we behave with each other, the way that we get on with each other. And while there were uh, a number of uh, people there that wanted to uh, you know, as I've seen before, you know, raise the straw man of different issues from Sharia law to halal taxes and, and the like. Uh, you know, they, they are just trying to find a platform, for, trying to find a way to get fear to feed off fear, and we shouldn't give them that platform. Do you platform. regard them as racist? No, uh, well, look, people can make that call. Uh, I'm just not uh, prepared to give them any more platform than they deserve, frankly, because uh, quite often we let people that are on the extreme cloud the way in which the bulk of people live their lives. And the way the bulk of Australians live their lives is they, they want to get on with each other. They just want to get through the day, get through the week, raise their children, have their families, get on in the, the broader community and uh, not be defined by, uh, like I said, some narcs on either side of the political spectrum. Nana Muscuri, uh, listening to this, you'd be a bit familiar um, with the idea of anti-Muslim rallies and even political yes, parties. Yes, I mean, in Europe it's much more uh, bigger lately. It became a very, a very important problem. But you see, they have been false at the beginning, like you say, for years, because there were a lot, and they haven't tried really to cope and understand and get together each, each one and be able to find solutions because people come into a country, they have to have a certain discipline at the same time as they help them to be in the country. And I think this is what is paying today. You know, they pay this default. And lately they have been extremely uh, uh, profound problems, really very tragic problems. 
And now it's becoming bigger and, and, and bigger, but I hope that it has to be with a political, like you say, approach. And only with dialogue, I, I think, you cannot really go down and fight. This is what it should be avoid. I think to have to be an understanding in between, because there is a truth for for both sides. You know. do you think, of do you course, think, there sorry, are some, no, some some people. The other side maybe is more uh, exigent, or how do you say, more demanding. But they all have uh, something right. You cannot condemn. Of course, the crime is is very is very hard. Yes. I'm just. Uh, can you actually reason with, um, for example, in in Greece, you have a political party called Golden Dawn. Yes. Yes. Um, openly, the leader describes himself as racist. Um, can yes. you reason with a political party like that? I wonder. No, I cannot. But you know, the problem is that uh, people have voted and they are in the parliament, so they have to find the reason why this was created. And maybe we are in Greece also. We have a responsibility to ignore maybe the social situation sometimes, and so that the people uh, come to have a help from a party like this, and it is voted. And they are really in the government. In yeah, I think they have not in the government, but they are in the, in the parliament. parliament. Yes, yeah. yes. You know, that, does that frighten Greece, you, though? Does it frighten you that the Golden course, Dawn have 17 uh, seats in the parliament? Of course, it frightened me because uh, Greece. You know, I'm an old timer, so I went through the the um, the war, the Second World War. I was a uh, little child of four years old, so I lived the occupation. And when, I, when they finished, there was a civil war. And then when they finished the civil war, when we tried to go further, there was, of course, uh, we, no king, kingdom anymore. We became a, a, a democracy after a very hard way. And before that, there was, there was also a dictature. So we were trying, really, to, to build up Greece from the beginning uh, because we came out of the war. So my, our problem, like all, all problem, the problem for everybody, I think, is to have friends, mm. not to have enemies. Mm. And, and this is what is important, to be friendly with them as well, not to receive them as enemies or, or so, and, and direct them, maybe, what, what they should learn, have a discipline when they come to a country, the, the foreigners, let's say. It's a, things we, I mean, they happen, what can you do? People suffer and they try to find help from somewhere and they, they give their trust to those, to those who do it. All right, I'm going to uh, just go to Michael. Um, I haven't heard from you yet and uh, you didn't publish a paper this morning, but if you did... Online, what, we're online constantly. Would you have, <laughs> okay, would you, how would you have covered this particular thing? Because the headlines uh, that we mostly saw were the RSL complaining about the flag burning, but we hear a, a broader, a more um, nuanced story from someone who was at the rally. Well, I think as, as Kelly and, and Ed have both said, Australia's got a very successful, successful multicultural uh, society. Uh, we don't have the levels of violence that you see elsewhere and uh, there may be, it seems apparently there is, as Van says, a tiny neo-Nazi element in society. Uh, they want to create a bit of noise. Uh, Van and, and co have managed to uh, establish a, a group of people far larger to protest against them. That sounds good. Uh, you wouldn't want to have uh, violence break out on the streets of Melbourne because on, on the streets of Melbourne or another, any other city because Australians are very much opposed to bringing any sort of tensions like that onto, onto Australia's soil. But other countries, as um, uh, even in the, the Greek uh, government, as I understand it, far far left government is still partly propped up by a, by one of the, a small far right. Uh, party as a member of the coalition, which is very anti-immigration. So uh, we don't have that that uh, anywhere near that level of uh, tension in Australia, except in the Senate. <laughs> Nothing like that, though. Um, actually, well, actually, our question has got a hand up again. We'll quickly go back to you, perhaps for a comment. Even though we all agree that the behaviour, regardless, you know, what the intention is, is not acceptable, it still is showing that we are slowly going to accept it as a new norm because the people who run the country, the politicians, are taking the sidelines and they're saying, yes, it's not good that it's happening, but there is no proactive action happening to actually stop it from happening in the future. OK, we'll take that as a comment because we've got quite a few questions to move on to. The next one's from Max Kozlovsky. 
A recent report titled The Forgotten Children detailed 30 incidences of sexual assault against children in detention. How many more basic human rights must be violated before the public sees a genuine change in asylum seeker policy? Kelly O'Dwyer. Well, certainly we don't accept violence against children, against anybody in detention, particularly sexual violence. Um, it is unacceptable, unequivocally it is unacceptable. And our foremost concern ought to be, Max, with those children. Uh, when we first came into government, uh, we were dealing with a caseload legacy of more than 30,000 people who had arrived on shore, who had arrived unauthorised by boat, around 8,000 children had arrived and around 2,000 children were in detention. Now that compares to no children in detention under the previous coalition government because of the policies that we had had in place. The problem at the moment is that we need to reduce the number of children in detention. We need to do that very quickly. That's what the government has been setting out to do. And we have reduced that number from 2,000 to less than 200. We've reduced it by more than 93%. And we are now dealing with a number of very difficult cases of children who are in detention, partly due to the fact that one or both of their parents have had an adverse security assessment made against them and the parents well, one of the parents has decided to keep the whole family together intact, uh, either because they have a genuine desire to keep the family intact or because uh, it is part of a, a strategy to help get, perhaps in certain circumstances, the father out of detention. Kelly, I'm just going to interrupt you for a moment. Um, our questioner had, he, had his hand back up. I'll just quick, go quickly back to you. Go ahead. The main um, discussion you just had there was about Labor's actions. Uh, the fact that others may have abused children more in the past does not excuse the actions of the present, particularly what any government may be doing. Can you justify the program that you're running at the well, moment? Well, no, no, no. I, and that's the very point that I was making, is we're getting children out of detention. It's not acceptable to have children in detention. I don't want children in detention. The government you, doesn't um, want children in detention. Could you just uh, end that overnight by saying no more children in detention and taking them all out of detention? Well, well we, we, the, the problem there with that... Going. The problem... No, the, there is a problem with that. The Labor Party... Yeah, there, is, there is an issue with that, and that is... If you basically say to people, smugglers, uh, if you bring your children on that dangerous and perilous journey overseas, you are going to be put into community detention straight away rather than uh, But Kelly, famously, detention. can I just interrupt you? Because famously, uh, there are no more coming. So what you're dealing with now is a legacy group. So um, well, that's that, and, and that's because our policies are working, Tony. That's exa that's that's given, an given endorsement that those, so, of the so policies we've put Given that they've worked, uh, that you're now dealing with a legacy group of that's people right, and we're trying to who get are in long-term detention. detention. Could you not simply make a policy of taking all children out of detention tomorrow? Well, we and, would like and, to, and if necessary, their parents. Well, we would like to. Then and do but it. Part of but part of the part of the issue here is that um, you can't always take children out of detention when the parents have said that they want their children with them in circumstances where there has been an adverse security assessment. This is a complex issue. We want children out of detention. We've reduced the number by more than 93%. Uh, as Tony has said, our policies are working. We have not seen children arrive unauthorised by boat and be put in detention in the way that they were being put in detention under the previous government. OK, let's, uh, sorry, let's hear from the other panellists. Uh, Van Badham, you wanted to jump in there several times. Oh, absolutely. It's horrifying. Like, we are endorsing, by maintaining the detention centres, the institutionalisation of perfectly innocent people. We are spending $3 billion a year on the incarceration of people who have the full legal right, the full legal right to seek asylum in Australia. $3 billion a year is, I read a report that said that the UNHCR spends that much on trying to find homes for refugees. And we are spending that on maintaining these absolute outrages to humanity and decency, which are the camps. If you want children out of detention, let them out. We know that it's cheaper and more effective and more humane to have people in the community, supported by communities, with community resources while their claims are being processed. And I actually agree with your colleague, Craig Laundy, the Liberal member for Reid, who thinks that the easy way around this solution, the Malcolm Fraser way around this solution, is actually to increase our humanitarian intake so there are no refugees we, we who have are done being that. exposed. We have actually You have not increased no, it have. to the same levels as it. the Gillard government we, and you're certainly not no, increasing no, no, it. I think if you're going to make a point, you need to hear the answer. <laughs> well, I was just going to say we have actually increased the humanitarian intake. In fact, part of the problem was that we had 15,000 people who had arrived unauthorised by boat take up those places that were humanitarian places. So people smugglers determined 
who was to be given asylum in Australia as opposed to people who are sitting in offshore detention centres who ought to be given those places. Let's, let's spare a thought for those people who don't have the means to be able to pay a people smuggler to get on a boat to try and have a better life OK, in um, briefly, I'm going to interrupt uh, before I bring the other panellists in. We've got a gentleman with his hand up there. Go ahead. I have a debate with Claire Dwyer on this. Um, a couple of months ago, um, your party attacked the Commissioner of Human Rights, Gladys, because she put a report in both about Labor, about the, the times that um, Labor government was keeping children in detention centre as well as the new government and all that. And then your government turned around and tried to criticise her because she publicised and said that your government had spent more time keeping children in detention centre and all that than the Labor government did and all that and then okay, your right, government... Well, I'm sorry, well, I think we've got your point there. It's about the report from the Human Rights Commissioner which was uh, widely uh, criticised by your government because it had been done her. over a period of time. Thank you, well, sir. Well, well we, we didn't try and sack her. I mean, she was actually my former <laughs> law lecturer. <laughs> so I, I, I have actually sat in lectures and listened to Gillian Triggs on many occasions. Uh, but, but let me say this. Um, her report focused on children and that's what we should be focused on. We shouldn't get distracted by all of the other issues. We should be focused on the welfare of children and making sure that we have their best interests at heart. So can I just interrupt? Gillian Triggs' report, you're quite comfortable with it then? Well, well look, I, I don't like hearing reports about children who have been abused. I don't like hearing reports about how children were put into detention. She no, made it very so clear they were put into detention under the Labor Party, right. and that was a clear aspect of her report. So is it, were you then surprised that your own party roundly criticised well, her and many people well, called look, for her sacking? Well, I mean, I'll leave that to other commentators to commentate on things that people have commentated on. What I can say is, from my perspective, right. I think it's important to focus on the children. OK, I'm going to go to Ed Husick here. And, uh, as you've just heard, there were vastly more children mm -hmm. in detention under the Labor government. Um, so I guess the question for you is, are you ashamed of that? I oh, definitely don't want to see people uh, being kept in circumstances and having known people, you know, refugees who have, have uh, uh, settled in, in my part of Western Sydney as well. You know, they've had a hard enough time actually in their original country and then to have to go through the extra trauma, you don't want to have to see that happen. So and was the policy of detaining thousands of children under the Labor government wrong? And we had sought, actually, when Chris Bowen was Immigration Minister, to find ways to actually get children out of detention into community care and having NGOs provide that level of support, again, that was happening in the vulnerable fa families in uh, Western Sydney were being relocated. Um, you know, there were a number of things that we tried to do that you know, Kelly uh, wanted to inject the, the politics into it in terms of going back to what Labor did. Well, we tried to get a number of things done through the last parliament which just didn't go ahead. Mm -hmm. One of them was, for example, uh, we had a situation where, in trying to block some of our efforts, uh, then uh, uh, opposition immigration minister Scott Morrison struck a deal with the Greens to lift the immigration intake to 20,000, which he reneged on promptly when he got into office. And the other thing that he did once he got into office is to shut down on transparency. We had weekly press conferences where you couldn't find out what was going on and the type of things that actually the questioner was asking about the type of abuse that was occurring. Um, uh, and regardless, it's a shame on either party that well, it's I mean, a lot of that abuse, the sexual um, abuse of children, happened by uh, Labor was in power. Which is, and, and that, that is seemed to be the point, really. You didn't manage to get the children no, no, no. out of detention. And it, it is absolutely unacceptable. But the thing is, too, how do you deal with it if you've got a cloak that covers up transparency and doesn't allow these things to be openly uh, discussed? And when someone does look Hang at it... Are you talking about your government or their well, government? Well, both. Both. I mean, right. if we have done something wrong or if they have done something wrong, it has to be brought out to light. And the point I'm making is that you only do that through transparency. So, uh, and when they had someone in Gillian Triggs' report on it, they roundly criticised her rather than the situation at hand. And as for, uh, as for the success in terms of what's gone on, I mean, you know, we've had to... We, we set up... I mean, my, you know, the Labor Party set up the resettlement agreement with Papua New Guinea. Um, anything that uh, we're responsible for and in terms of any future uh, responsibility for the way in which uh, uh, facilities are managed under the coalition, they should be equally upfront and prepared to accept accountability, but you don't get that out of this government. All right, Michael Stutchbury. Oh, well, clearly, no one, no one wants to see children uh, in detention. Uh, it's, a, it's a horrible thought. But I think it is a very good thing that the numbers of children in detention 
uh, have definitely peaked and are coming down mm -hmm. and that as well that the number of children uh, dying at sea and other asylum seekers dying at sea has also ended. So that's a, that's a, uh, that's a very good thing. I think politically uh, the government's on pretty strong ground here and when you had the, the fact that uh, uh, whatever you think of the, what the previous, uh, previous government's policies, the government has stop, stopped the boats. That's what most Australians want to see. Uh, and, uh, and I think they'll get, they'll get political reward for that. And when the, the controversy over the Gillian Triggs Human Rights Commission report came out the other day, that got a lot of air time, but the, the, the government has had you know, virtually no noticeable uh, political downside from that. In fact, the government's standing has probably increased through that period. Uh, Nana, are you yeah. surprised to hear that Australia is still... I'm surprised, uh, yeah. I'm surprised for Australia. I didn't know. I just heard it. And I think it's really very, very sad to hear that. I mean, it's humanity is going away. It disappears. And I think the world needs a little bit more of humanity. And, you know, protect the children. They are the future of the world, wherever they come from, whether there is their nationality or so... I mean the grown-up people as well. Humanity we, we all need, but the children is, is, is something unbearable to believe. I didn't know that it happens here, really. It, 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 there are problems, of course, with refugees everywhere today. It, the world has become like this. But let's put some humanity in the laws, really, and uh, protect the children. So, uh, a... briefly... <laughs> I guess to summarise, you're, you're saying that there should be no children in detention at all under at all, any circumstances. At all. Yeah. Absolutely. Children, and they are protected. This is why I say UNICEF has done laws and really conventions about the children, and this is the first, the first to believe is to protect the children. It's not possible this way. And also abuse is really the first thing that appears today that happens to, to everywhere. So, so they must do as fast as they can. I mean, it's, it's children. Is uh, You're playing with lives that they are going to build a better world, so give them the chance to do that. This is very important. <laughs> OK, I, there's a few people with their hands up, but we'll leave that uh, subject there because we've got quite a few questions on different subjects. The next one is from Jack Christie. Hello. Yasu, Nana? Yasu, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, as a proud first-generation Australian uh, from Greek and Cypriot parents, yeah. I'd like to thank you for the joy and the pleasure that your show, The Nana Muskuri Show, uh, brought to hundreds of thousands of Australian Greeks. It was such a pleasure as a young child to gather around the TV set on a Sunday night and to watch my parents and other parents, the, the pleasure that it brought them to watch your show to hear Never on Sunday and to watch them stand up and sing and dance is a, was a wonderful feeling. And I'd like to ask, what was your experience like to serve the, in the European Parliament, considering that it was so different from entertainment field that you came from? Well, <laughs> this was a very difficult time for me. I was, because Greece, it's a, a new country, I must say, not new, it's a very old with a big history, but uh, our democracy was, came late. Uh, it's only 40 years old, you know, it's from the 70s, it's not much more. And so people are trying to, to get together and organise themselves. So I was asked to go because people thought, uh, the Greek, my Greek friends thought like Melina Mercuri was before, a great actress and also a very good politician. And when she, w she died, so they thought this is an opportunity to have Nana. But Nana was not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did go for the reason that they told me you can help your country. And I did, and I, I enjoyed it, but I stayed my five years that I had to do. I worked hard to, to learn how to work, and then I didn't stay. But I didn't want to continue, because it's a difference with, with politics and, and, and singers. Singers, we live with music, we give hope, we give love, we try really to make people uh, see a future, which I did when I was young. But I cannot commit myself by giving solutions, and these solutions are the politicians who give. So 
I realized that the decisions, excuse me, are very <laughs> difficult in the, in the parliament. Can, tell, can, I ask, can I ask a question? Did you yeah. learn to trust politics um, and politicians? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't because I, I realized that when they take the, the, the lead, when they are in power, they have to obey certain rules, which we don't know. They, they are not transparent. So they don't keep their promises always, because some they do. I must say it's not completely, but it's very difficult. So I. I don't trust always. You know, but <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I, mean, but I, I, I believe and I, I really know that only uh, politicians can give solutions. And this is very important. When people vote for somebody, you trust that they are the good ones. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I, I'm not a protester very easily. I mean, I just, I'm, I I'm going to ask Ed whether that actually uh, caused no? you to doubt your chosen career uh, <laughs> with, its, with its invisible rules. and. <laughs> Let's say it's factions and so on, actually oh, controlling get, what actually uh, goes on. I want to get my smartphone and go seek.com.au. <laughs> uh, yeah, low trust in politicians came as a great shock to me uh, a few moments ago. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I do have to say, uh, you know, you're not going to get, um, uh, and maybe uh, this is a second term uh, politician speaking. Uh, Kelly may have a different view, I don't know, but I think you do go in with the view, uh, and I, I represent an area I've grown up in, you want to be able to see politics affect change. You want to see better things happen in your local area, but you also want to change things within, or in our respect, in the national parliament uh, as well, and finding ways in which to, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, people that wouldn't necessarily see eye to eye, being able to find the bridge between yeah. people is one of the hardest things. And one of the hardest things too is within your own party. You know, there will be decisions that are made that you're not happy with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you raise your voice internally and then you have to go out and, as part of a group decision, you have to sell it. It's one of the, for me personally, it's one of the most difficult things because... Selling I guess stuff I'm you very, don't believe in. Well, I guess, no. Uh, that would be by difficult. My very nature, by my very nature, I want to be able to speak up on the things that mean a lot to me. Mm. And, uh, but you've got, if you look at it, within your own political party, there are a lot of different voices that feel the same way. So you have to be able to have the balance between speaking your mind, but also working together in a unified way to get things done. I'm just going to uh, give the other politician a chance to respond as well. Kelly, you're, you're about to bring don't new life me, into the world. <laughs> uh, not uh, because you're sort of low down, probably That's a lot right. of people don't realise that you're five weeks away from giving birth. But um, do you think that politics could be reborn in this country? Because trust is so low in politicians and the promises they make and break mm -hmm. Is there any way you think that could be repaired? Look, I think, it's, I think it's really devastating that a lot of people who would potentially consider a life of public service, which is mm. what Ed and I have chosen yeah. to do and what Nana chose to do for those, for those five years, I think, I think there'd be a lot of people out there who would make the decision perhaps not to go into politics by virtue of the fact that it is held in such low regard. And yet, I think no matter what your political perspective, most people who go into politics go into politics because they believe very, very strongly in trying to build the future of their country, trying to shape the direction of their country in a positive way, making it better than what it was uh, before they went in. And I believe that those people who go in do that with the strong view that they've got certain values that they represent and that they have something to contribute. Now, we don't always agree, and as Ed said, sometimes you disagree more vehemently with people on your own side of politics than sometimes you do with the people so across recently? the aisle. <laughs> 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 sometimes you do that more vehemently than people across the aisle. But, I mean, Ed and I have worked together on a committee. Um, we haven't always agreed on everything, but uh, we've been able to work really constructively together. <laughs> <laughs> OK, guys, I'm going to... I'm going to interrupt because we've actually got quite a few questions to get to. I'm sorry to oh, uh, uh, interrupt your flow there, Kelly. Uh, next question is from Nina Larkin. Uh, yes, good evening. Thanks, Tony, and good evening, panel and everybody. Um, in 1940, the Greek Prime Minister said, Ohi, no, to the Italian invasion, the Axis power invasion of Greece. Um, this week, the Prime Minister of Greece faces a big dilemma. Will he um, pay the creditors the 450 million euros that the country owes this week? Um, or will he pay the pensions 
and public service salaries, which also are due this week. In other words, will he feed his people, reduce austerity? Now, although the creditors may have been um, somewhat irresponsible, because Greece was already more or less bankrupt in 2010, it's still never a good idea to default. So my question to the panel is, should the Prime Minister of Greece say, oh, he, no, to its creditors? I'll start with uh, Michael Stutchbury, because um, I know you've followed this pretty closely. And, uh, uh, actually, there's, there's, <laughs> there's news tonight that actually the Greek foreign minister, who's, who learnt his trade in Melbourne uh, to a large degree, um, is now saying that Greece will pay back uh, its debt uh, under any circumstances they will, but perhaps slower than the creditors want. Yeah, that's uh, Yanis uh, Varoufakis, the finance minister, the mm. Greek Australian finance minister. And I think this week it's uh, 450 million euros, which is part of a, a repayment to the IMF. And I think the, the uh, Greek government uh, has vowed to say it will definitely pay back the IMF. Uh, it does not want to default on its debts. It wants to get a negotiated package. But I think what you're seeing right now is we have had an election of really what is quite a very far left Greek government uh, in, uh, in a government in Greece. Uh, they've given the finger to the to the Germans. Uh, I'll explain that to you in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's an Australian expression, isn't uh, it? It's a rude well, one. It, it, <laughs> photographically, they actually have given the finger to the, to the Germans. Uh, they're threatening to cosy up to Vladimir Putin, to, uh, to align themselves with the Russians, which in turn are then threatening to undermine uh, EU sanctions against Russia over the whole, uh, whole of the Ukraine issue. So they're really sort of kicking up a big fuss, uh, threatening to cause all sorts of prob problems in the, in the whole Euro area, because a Greek default would be a very bad thing. And, and uh, a Greek, a, a so-called Grexit, where Greece uh, exited from, uh, from the Euro would be a very dangerous thing as well, very uncertain as to what would happen. But I think the basic thing is that uh, Greece went into the crisis really overextended. It had year after year under the euro where they could borrow on very very favourable terms as though they were part of had the credit rating of the Germans. They borrowed and they had uh, budget deficits of 6% of GDP, a net debt, a government debt of 100% of GDP, current account deficits of 6 to 8% of GDP and they basically had a cost structure uh, that was uncompetitive. You know, they, they can't compete with, uh, with, a, with a drachma as it was then at the current level linked to the euro and then in turn linked to the, to the Deutschmark, the old Deutschmark. So they're very uncompetitive. Uh, they've just got back to, with a lot of pain, have got back to having what's known as a, a primary budget balance where, excluding their interest payments, they're now just getting the budget in balance. But they, they were a long way in deficit beforehand and basically they're not competitive enough uh, and uh, now they're trying to create a big stir so they can get a bit of a haircut on, uh, to the creditors on some of their debt. They'll probably get it, mm. but I don't think that'll be the end of it because fundamentally they've got to become more competitive economy, they've got to attract foreign capital, they've got to become pro-business, mm. and the government that's installed there shows no signs of doing that. In fact, the opposite. It's All right, no, I'll, I'll bring in Van Batum. I don't know if you ever met the uh, Melbourne-trained uh, Greek... Finance Minister oh, Vera alas, Farkas. Alas. <laughs> you have met him. So, um, no, I haven't met him, but I do. I, he scared, I am he scared great the pants fan off a lot of, of his people clothes. In <laughs> yes. Well, that's right. He, he scared the pants off a lot of uh, European creditors well, uh, early on. I can imagine he would, because certainly, you know, words and rhetoric along the lines of we are going to feed our people, we are going to honour pensions, our priority is community and society, are very terrifying to a lot of neoliberal assumptions about how we run economies. And this is, you know, the situation we find ourselves in, um, in the, the discussion in other Western countries about Greece. We have to be realistic about what happened there. The austerity fans are very keen in saying, oh, their spending was out of control. It was. It wasn't sensible spending. But they had a massive revenue problem. And this is one of the things that's very important for us as Australians to consider, that the taxation system in Greece was not working. They had a different taxation system to ours where you declared your income tax. It wasn't 
PAYE. There were opportunities for all kinds of rorts within the taxation system. So combined with irresponsible spending and an eroded taxation base, that's why the Greek economy started to fall apart. So obviously, we're now in a situation where we have millions of people who need to eat, who don't have um, reliable work, who are living in a completely unstable society where there is the rise of a fascist party. What are the government supposed to do? Prioritise the banks or the people? For me, easy decision. It would be the people. But this is what we see. Austerity, austerity is always a code for reassure the banks before you reassure your population. It's not actually about generating um, any kinds of economic opportunity. Economic opportunity is generated by spending. Austerity is about making banks feel more comfortable about getting their loans back. All right. Uh, Nana, yeah, you know, it, it's, sort of... a, it's a very complicated uh, 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 theme to speak about and I really it, it's not when you are not uh, very much involved you don't know the truth the only thing I want to say and just I hope that the lady will be uh, understand what I mean the country has a big problem at this moment and I think you cannot make a revolution and change the whole thing we need Europe absolutely Greece is, at, and at this point, the most important thing is to, to solve the people's problem. And, and then you can go and ask for what, whatever you want. This is another problem. You cannot, in a crisis, go and say, yes, but you, we, you owe us or make enemies with everybody. No. We have to be friends, and, and Europe is with us. I mean, and I believe in Europe because the first thing was not to have war around. Mm. And, and there was no war. And though 55 years, or how many they are now, 60, 70, uh, we didn't have a war in Europe. And this was important, really, to do. We have to get along, and it's a pro problem of culture. culture when we got together in Europe, we didn't meet with our culture. It was only economic or so. And this is wrong. We are humans. We have a culture. Nobody can insult the other. We have to get to know each other and make a, a, a compromise, but in peace. I live outside from Greece for more than 50 years. I haven't lost my <coughs> Greek identity. I tried to communicate with everybody. Everybody, I speak most of the languages in, in, in Europe because I wanted to be friends and understand them. And I think when you can, with, with your own uh, way to dialogue and recoup why, what you didn't ask a certain moment, you know, that, that, so, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's okay, but, uh, but, but I accept well, one, the One changes. thing you did, living outside of Greece, you certainly had to pay your taxes. And I pay, no, if you, and lots of people me. in Greece, <coughs> yes. lots of, you're not going to say you didn't. <laughs> no, no. Be headline, I, I tell you, I, you won't believe me, but I'm a very honest Greek, and I'm very proud. I never go. Yes, I never go any place without paying. The first thing I had when I went, I was a very poor girl. I got myself a very good lawyer that he should really pay attention to what was I was earning, why I was there, to have a permit where I was. Mm -hmm. I was not a clandestine or you know, so, so, and I do pay my taxes. I have no problem with it. <laughs> can, I, can, can I just and ask you that? Was... In many countries, you know, in many I'm, I'm countries. I'm so glad to hear also. that. And I'm yeah. sure all those um, yeah. finance ministers in those countries would be happy as well. But can I just ask a yeah. question? Isn't that one of the big problems? Uh, for Greece, that most Greek people, or yes. many, many Greek people, mm -hmm. did not pay their taxes. This I cannot tell you. I'm not there to know. You know, that's okay. uh, that's. Uh, how can I say what they do? I mean, it's uh, even if I was there, nobody knows what your neighbour does. No, do you say what you do? <laughs> okay, we, we're going to we're going to we're going to move on to the Australian economy now because we've got quite a few questions on huh? that as well. Uh, we have a question from Patrick Westman. My question is to Michael Studgebury. Michael. Your readership, the business community, requires a level of certainty surrounding the government's economic agenda and the country's economic future. But the government's key economic document, the budget, has proven very difficult to pass. Where do you look to to understand the government's economic agenda and the country's economic future direction? And what is the impact of that uncertainty on the business community? 
Yeah, I think, uh, like uh, in, a, in a mini version of Greece, I think Australia is uh, is getting itself into a, a, a bit of a spot of bother now. Uh, the uh, it's clear that we've been through the the biggest mining and resources boom in our whole, in our history. Uh, the iron ore price, uh, which was which is our biggest export uh, at the start of the 2000s, was around about twenty to thirty dollars. It went up to a hunt peak of one hundred and eighty dollars. Uh, in, uh, in 2011, 2012, the Reserve Bank Governor said that was the greatest gift of income to Australia since the gold rush of the, uh, of the 1850s. But since then, of course, the, the iron ore price has headed south. And it's headed south much faster than people had expected. And just over the Easter, it's got down to, I think, US $47 a tonne. I think Australians don't really realise how much our high standard of living and our prosperity really depends on the price we get for our major exports iron ore and coal and other primary commodities, we're basically a commodity exporting country. The price the rest of the world has pay, pay, pays us for this has really taken a big dive. Uh, that's really affected our budget position and the budget has built in a whole lot of promises over the next decade and a whole lot of pressures coming from the ageing population, which means there's a whole lot of promises. But what's happening is the rest of the world is not paying us as much as we thought it would for, our, for what we sell to the rest of the world. That means our tax revenues have fallen and there's this nasty gap that's opened up over, over, over the budget deficit. And the political system is now failing to come up with really a consensus about how to close that, that gap. Because we're also very now reliant on China, very vulnerable to something going wrong with China. China's got some imbalances in its own economy. If they take a hiccup, the unemployment rate could could go up. Uh, the budget deficit, if we get a downturn here in the Australian economy, we, we're overdue for one. We haven't had one in nearly a quarter of a century. Mm -hmm. If we get a significant downturn, our budget deficit will blow out, as the Reserve Bank Governor says, in a heartbeat to about 6% of GDP. That would be $90 billion. That would affect our AAA credit rating. It would also affect the AA credit rating mm -hmm. of our banks, and they've got to borrow money offshore just to keep the place afloat. Our housing prices are now being inflated by very low interest rates, record low interest rates, and it's pushing up our house prices at the same time as our export prices are falling. So we've got a, quite a big imbalance that we've got to face, and the political system, through Ed and Kelly and, uh, and, other, and other political leaders, but also the whole country, has got to figure out a way that we've just got to make some adjustments. We've got a, we've got a bright future, uh, we're a very prosperous nature, but we do have to deal with the fact that suddenly you know, our income is now shrinking. Uh, it went up by between uh, the early 1990s and around about 2012, Australian income went up per capita by about two thirds. It's been a, a golden two decades for us. Since 2012, it's been coming off. It's actually been declining slightly. So that, that period of very strong income growth is now over and we're fighting over a, a, a pie which is now shrinking. So Michael, um, and if you can answer this briefly, um, it, it goes to, I guess, the heart of the question is where do you look then for reform? Uh, because we heard from the uh, president of the BCA just yesterday that it has to be decoupled from the budget. Because you, can't no, you can no longer, because of the political process, look for reform in the Australian budget. Well, I think there's, we've, clearly we've got to get the budget under control. And that's the, the budget, getting the budget uh, right is the foundation. It's been the foundation, along with a credible monetary policy and low inflation for these two decades of... So uh, you, but, but have there right. been mixed messages coming from the government on the Definitely. Floor? Because I, uh, on the one hand, a few months ago, this was the biggest crisis ever, and now apparently it's not such a big crisis. I think it goes back to the trust in government issue we talked about before, that, uh, the, that no, so, no, neither side of politics really squared with the Australian electorate in the September 2000 elec election. Uh, both sides, uh, the government talked a big talk about it, but unusually for him, Tony Abbott hasn't shown enough conviction on this, on this issue. He went saying we've got a budget crisis, but we're not going to cut this, this, this and this. We're not even cut the, a cut the ABC, for God's sake. <laughs> uh, uh, and so there's no... just lost the crowd. So, so there's no emergency. <laughs> okay, and and, and right. plus a parental paid leave scheme, which com totally contradicted it. Now, then he, then, he goes, then he goes and says, oh, no, we've got to cut all this stuff. People say, because the, f the first thing, the f it's like the no denial of the population, they don't want to hear the thing, and they're very willing to blame in this case. Okay, I we're think, calling for a brief answer here, remember. With, <laughs> with, 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 with some justification, blaming the politicians for not saying we do have a bit of problem, we do have to fix it up, and we've turned to this lack of trust and broken promises debate. The, right. the system's got to get back into dealing with this Let's, problem. Uh, Van Batten. Well, it's, it's very interesting to hear about you know, the falling iron ore prices. Um, in the context of the fact that 
you know, the Labor government did try and bring in a mining resource tax that was fought bitterly by the mining industry when times were good. When times were good, there was an opportunity for us as a people to tax and realise our wealth as a nation, which was in our deposits and our iron ore deposits. Now, that was fought so bitterly that that tax became toothless and meaningless, and we didn't recoup uh, when times were good. Times were good, and we, as a people, could have had the revenue from when times were good. And it's a simplistic way of saying it, but that's what we're left with now. We don't have a situation like they have in Norway, where their sovereign wealth fund from their oil deposits has made guarantees against, you know, fluctuations in oil prices and, you know, God help them, the, the end of their oil reserves. We gave that opportunity up. I mean, we're essentially, if all we're doing is thinking in economic terms about iron ore prices, we really should nationalise Gina Reinhardt and declare her a national treasure and, and take, take the wealth that could have come to us from the Spoken like a true Marxist. No, no, this, is, this is not a question of Marxism. This is a question of fair taxation. And if we're talking well, about economic... Well, I think economic... nationalising Gina Reinhardt probably is a question I am of being, I'm Marxism being facetious to of... illustrate a point. Okay, the right. point is okay. that we had an opportunity and we lost it. Right. And if we're looking for guarantees within the economy and genuine reform, we have to look at taxation fairness. In the news today... Rupert Murdoch, $4.5 billion. OK, we'll come to that in a minute, from... uh, Van, but I want to hear from uh, Kelly O'Dwyer. We're running out of time for our questions, and so I'll just ask everyone just to keep their answers a little shorter. Yeah. I'm uh, sorry about that. Look, look, I'll be brief in response to Patrick's question. I think the first point to make here is that uh, we were talking earlier about austerity, and when austerity hits, it hurts, and it hurts some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. We never want to get to a situation in Australia where we are bringing in austerity <coughs> measures. The Reserve Bank Governor has warned, as Michael has said, has warned over many hearings of the House Standing Committee on Economics that we're on the wrong path. We're on the wrong trajectory at the moment. We are spending far more than we bring in. And it's not simply a matter of our income dropping. It is also because we exponentially increase spending in this country and we did it uh, at an unsustainable level and at the moment if we were to continue on the path that we were left when we first came into government net debt to GDP would have over the next 40 years as evidenced by the intergenerational report would have blown out to around about 122 percent now it's not Greece Greece is 171 percent but it's double that of Spain now, if we continue on the path that we've currently got at the moment, where we have reduced some spending, but it is still growing. It is still growing. We're not paying back debt yet. If we go along the path that we have legislated in the Senate, we are going to hit Spain levels. Italy and Spain levels of around about 60 of net debt to GDP. Michael makes a good point before, which is... So does that mean, so does that, does that, mean the logic of that would be you're going to have to have a very, very tough budget the logic of coming that means, up in May? No, no, the logic of that no, means dull, that we need... Budget. No, dull, tough budget. It's going to be dull the logic, and tough. The logic, <laughs> the logic is that we need to have a sensible adult conversation about what we are spending on, what our priorities are as a nation, and we also need to have a sensible discussion about how revenue is raised. Will you have that raised. discussion before the budget or after well, it? We're going to continue because it sounds that. like the budget is not going to be tough anymore well, because you've been scared off having tough budgets. Well, well no, I mean, you're, you're, you asked the question before, Tony, you know, when you bring about reform, do you do that overnight or do you have a proper conversation about it? Clearly, you need to have a proper conversation about it. That's what the intergenerational report is all about. It's about setting the framework to have this discussion because we know there are going to be okay. increased pressures on the budget. And the tax discussion paper is also an opportunity to look at how we can increase and grow our economy. OK, it's about Kelly, our, our economy. next question is about that. It's about the uh, tax issue indeed. It's from Noel Rowland, and I'll bring Ed in first to answer that. Go ahead, Noel. Thanks, Tony. Recent reports have suggested the government is considering introducing a Google tax, a specific tax integrity measure to target multinationals who are allegedly uh, shifting profits overseas to avoid paying tax in Australia. How does the juxtaposition of tinkering with the system like this fit with the government's mantra that everything is on the table and the rethink of the tax system as a whole? I should add that Noel is the CEO of the Tax Institute. And uh, I'll go first to uh, Ed Husick uh, on that question. On the issue of the, the Google tax, uh, sounded great on paper, but there's an issue uh, because we'd actually investigated it uh, on our side of the fence. And the, the problem is you've got a whole series of tax agreements 
that uh, you know, are going to be uh, effectively, if you bring in the Google tax, the question is whether or not it had run uh, counter those agreements and whether or not you'd uh, draw retaliatory action from other, other countries. So it's not as clear cut. But we have said that this issue of uh, as you've seen these tech giants grow and as you've seen the way that they've set up their businesses in different parts of the world in different jurisdictions, um, that there is an issue there and we need to deal with it. And we'd had a series of proposals uh, that we'd uh, proposed when we were in government, uh, weren't followed through by this government. And uh, we've actually come up on our side of the fence with proposals to try and address uh, multi, you know, multinational uh, profit shifting and the impact on tax that would uh, be able to benefit the bottom line by about $2 billion. Um, we, we're trying to find these ways to change the tax system in a world that's changing itself. Uh, but it's going to take some work and some commitment so, by both so, sides of politics uh, to get that done. So, do you support the uh, hockey idea of investigating, as he's doing, what many multinationals are actually doing in this he's, country and then working out a way... He's doing a lot of investigating them. and a lot of speaking and very little acting. I mean, he's been talking about this. You could do as many Google searches on how many times Joe Hockey's actually talked about this and get a lot more responses than any action that he's undertaken um, physically to, to follow this issue up. We were told it would be dealt with at the G20. We were told in a ministerial statement this would be, this would be happening. Um, and it's just not, not eventuating. So there needs to be uh, some work in, in, that, uh, in that space, but you're not seeing it. Michael Stosbury, I'll just bring you in. I'll go to uh, Kelly and the other panellists. But, uh, I mean, Fairfax reported over the weekend, Van Batten just referred to it, um, that your old boss, uh, Rupert Murdoch, uh, been shifting uh, $4.5 billion uh, back to the United <coughs> States. Is that, is that a profit shifting? arrangement in the same way that we're talking about with the other multinationals like it, Google and Apple and all of the other, well, the mining companies, Rio Tinto and so on? Yeah, well, I'm not sure whether it's exactly the same as what's alleged for, for Google and uh, Apple and so forth. And the Financial Review, review we will be reporting tomorrow instances of this that uh, relate to our big mining companies, as you say, BHP and Rio. I think it's an issue for so all... So how big is it with those big mining companies, if you can uh, reveal what's going to be in the paper well, tomorrow? Well, they're reasonably big, but I think both sides of politics... How many uh, billions? I won't give you a, a, a billion number, but You're both. You sound like a politician. <laughs> like. <laughs> both it's sides are paywalls. It's, it's all about the paywalls. I'm sides... trying to talk to you through the paywall now. <laughs> both sides of politics are yeah. clearly uh, focusing on how can, and in fact, tax uh, officers around the world. Uh, are all focusing on how they can get uh, stop profit shifting by multinational corporations, which means they somehow have no no uh, domicile, or they have a domicile in a very low tax jurisdiction. They want to get more money out of it. So I think that's uh, it, it would get very technical, one way or another, uh, <coughs> through the OECD or through individual countries. They'll move to screw more money out of international international multinationals. But I don't think that's the solution the ultimate solution to the budget problem Australia finds itself in. It's, it's bigger than that. And nor is it just a matter of just slapping on a, a mining tax. Under the mining tax that Kevin Rudd brought out, we'd be now, the tax office would, would shortly be <laughs> handing out money to the, to the mining companies that were going broke. Because under, under that regime, the Australian government actually took a 40% equity stake in mining companies. So it would have been very bad on, on the downside. It's one of the reasons why that tax blew, blew up. But it's, so it's clearly an issue that governments around the world are going to tackle. It's very technical, but it's not the thing that's going to get us out of our budget sure. hole. Sure, mm. Van Batten. Well, I mean, what's going to get us out? I, I'm, it's very difficult to listen to the rhetoric around, mm. oh, it's all about spending, it's all about out of control spending. It's about taxation fairness and it is about revenue. And if we want to look at taxation fairness within the Australian economy, yes, we have to look at the gouging that's going on with multinational corporations, tax havens and, and hiding taxation revenue from the Australian people. That's outrageous. We also have to plug the hole in superannuation that we all know is there. We know that the, with superannuation capped at a 15% tax, that the highest income earners in Australia are able to put put their, their capital assets into superannuation. It's a flaw in the system and it is gouging that system which is supposed to pay for our ageing population. It means, that, um, it means that money is being hidden from us by the people who can most afford to give back to the economy. We also have to look at things like negative gearing. Negative gearing was originally introduced in Australia to increase supply within the housing market. The idea was that you would invest as, as a private investor in a new build and you would get a tax credit because a house would be created that people could move into. Well, all of a sudden negative gearing, because of reforms made by Howard, is about investing in getting tax breaks for merely owning Property. Okay, we're, we're nearly running out of time, all so of I'm going to have to get you to wind up. All of these things are things that we have to address before we start cutting spending, which usually affects the poorest and most vulnerable Australians. That's what we have to do.
Kelly O'Dwyer, um, a quick response, if you can. Well... It sounds like you are. I mean, if, if we believe what's written about what's intended, um, although we have to wait for tax papers and then reviews and then beyond the reviews, you know, the green and the white paper and so on, and then some years down the track you might get some change. But uh, are, are you going to change in these areas we're talking about? So, so uh, we, we agree that we should not have profit shifting overseas. It is one of the issues that we took up when we had the presidency of the G20, when we took that on. Joe Hockey made it one of his cause celebs and we were able to get agreements with a number of international partners uh, on that particular issue. And we're working together with the OECD because the truth is, if there is international profit shifting, uh, they will go somewhere else. And you need to have international agreements in place in order to stop it. So that is what we are working on. But that hasn't stopped us making changes to thin capitalisation rules, where you've got people trying to take money out of the country that ought to stay in the country. Uh, we're looking at plugging those loopholes. We have been doing that consistently. But it is not going to be the silver bullet to the budget repair. It, you know, the, even on Labor's own figures on this particular issue, where they said we were going to raise $1.6 billion dollars is unfortunately a drop in the ocean of what we Are need to see any silver bullets in this budget well well you know it's going to be a hard slog the whole way okay. through there is no one silver bullet right. and to pretend that there is is actually very dishonest all right um and uh, Nana, can I li listen to this whole discussion about yes, multinationals and the yeah, taxes? Yes, they, absolutely. Uh, do, uh, are the multinationals, in a moral <laughs> sense, are the multinationals who aren't paying taxes, are they any better I, I than the it, tax I dodgers think, in Greece? I think it's, it's very normal to pay taxes. I think this is very honest. You work, you pay taxes. I mean, that, that's normal. But I must say something uh, also, that life is very difficult. I just want to say this. It's very difficult, but it's beautiful if you want to believe. There are people who suffer even much more than we think they do or we suffer. They all both have a hope because there is hope in life. We have to learn about the taxes. It's a new world. We, we never spoke before about money so much as they do to get to today. I mean, we only, I was only thinking to sing my little song and then it became, <laughs> uh, yes, and then it became a, a work that I could get paid. And, uh, but I must say, there is sadness in life and there is also happiness. They both have an end. We have to go through sadness sometimes in order to get to, to, to the happiness. But once you get to the happiness, it also has an end. So we have to try to be fair and honest and pay our taxes and do everything we can so that it won't end. But there are problems everywhere. But let's hope that they will be solved. The, the, the people, I think they listen also, the politicians, they give the solutions and they listen tonight. So thank you very much all because everybody has, a, has an opinion that it is worth of listening and then you decide whom you like. Right. That's final, <laughs> final, <laughs> final uh, quick word to Ed. Uh, now, Ed, you can either come up with a solution now or you can sing us a song. What yeah, I've choose? got it right here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, a brief solution. I think the, look, very, very, very quickly, uh, I think the key thing is, uh, Michael was touching on the enormity of the, the problems facing the, the country and what needs to be done. Now, uh, I think the biggest thing is um, being able to have, you know, with reform processes, there are going to be winners and losers, uh, but people have got to be able to trust the process. And I, my big concern about the, where Australian policy is going is we paid a price in the last term. People believed that we were doing things that um, uh, we said we wouldn't do, and we you know, we got uh, hit and hit well. The other side of politics uh, said that they would be very virtuous and, you know, well, you've seen the last or the first 18 months of this government, um, I wouldn't describe it as virtuous. The, the key for both sides of politics is to be able to, in the reform process, engender public trust. We've got to find a way to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, I think the biggest thing that's been of uh, concern uh, is the fact that, you know, Michael, you made reference to the fact that broken promises and trust seem to occupy so much of this space, but that's been the problem, that that trust has been drained um, and the Coalition's going to have to work hard to, to get that back. OK, we're um, going to have to leave it there because that is all we have time for, and I'm sorry to say. And to those of you who have your hands up, I'm sorry about that too, but we uh, have to leave it there. Please thank our panel, Ed Husick, Nana Muscuri, Van Badham, Kelly O'Dwyer and Michael Stutchbury. <laughs> Nana, that is your cue. Thank you very much. Now, next Monday, 
Next Monday, we'll be joined by Australian journalist Peter Grester, who spent 400 days in an Egyptian jail. The manager of government business in the Senate, Mitch Feifeld. The Labor member for Perth, Lana McTiernan, and the chief executive of the regional Australia Institute, Sue McCluskey. Now, we'll end tonight with Nana Muscuri singing her much-loved classic, and feel free to join in, The White Rose of Athens. Till next week's Q&A, good night. And you can sing along if you know the song or hum or something that will help me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. It's the forum where you set the agenda. Head to the Q&A website to register for our audience, upload a video question for our panel, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Plus, use hashtag Quanda and join the live discussion during the show. Q&A, for the people, by the people, where every question counts.